You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. This episode is sponsored by Demand Derivatives, a startup futures exchange and clearinghouse trading the world's major assets in a creative new way. You already trade on an exchange. Here is your chance to own one. Before they approach large strategic partners for funding, the pioneering team at Demand Derivatives launched a crowdfunding portal so that regular traders have the chance to buy shares. Learn more and become a part of this revolutionary fintech project now at demandderivatives.com slash crowdfunding. You wanted it, you got it. A radio program that helps teach you options trading inside and out, basic to complex. This is Options Bootcamp. Whether you want to learn how to protect your portfolio, generate income, or even become a master of volatility, the Options Bootcamp drill instructors will break it all down for you. Now, let's get you into peak options trading shape. Here are your Options Bootcamp drill instructors. All right, everybody, that music means it is Education Wednesday, time to get your learning on, and it is time for Options Bootcamp, the program for you out there, the super active these days, <laughs> retail beginner options trader. Maybe you're a stock guy looking to become the beginner options guy. Maybe you're already that beginner options trader. You want to take the next step. Maybe you've had some problems. Maybe you just want to turn things up to 11. Either way, we got you covered here on Options Bootcamp. Reminding you, if you like what you hear, this show, everything else we do, on the network, a whole bunch of you I know mainline boot camp. And if you just want to do that, that's fine. But you're missing out on about a dozen other shows close to it on the network out there. So make sure you upgrade to the full network wherever you get this A and B. Keep rating and reviewing. It does help new folks discover the show in these crazy troubled times that we are all sailing through together. And speaking of together, I'm not alone on this show. No, I'm joined once again by my compatriot, my partner in crime, the dark-hatted one, to my light-hatted one, he is Mr. Dan Passarelli, the founder of Market Taker Mentoring and the author of one or two or half a dozen options-oriented tomes. Mr. P, welcome to the Options Boot Camp Program, sir. Or half a dozen options-oriented oh, You're getting tomes. some feedback there, huh, bud? Uh, how's that? Say that a little better? Yeah, that's what I thought right. I was hearing voices in my head. <laughs> well, you are hearing voices in your head, but that's another <laughs> conversation for another day. Mr. P, welcome to the Options Bootcamp Drill Instructor Proving Ground, sir. <laughs> oh, All right. hold on Let's a see second. The third. What are you running over there, sir? What are you hearing me on? In Turn your speakers off. It was coming live through Twitter. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's like oh. it's like the radio call-in shows. You got to turn off your radio when you call in the DJ, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, that's never happened before. I've had Twitter open. I, I, to use a reference that no one under 25 even gets there in the audience. So, well, what the hell's a radio call-in show, Mom? All yeah. right. <laughs> Speaking of the listeners, they've been inundating us. Usually we do, you know, an episode of like a deep dive into a topic. Then the next week we do more questions. But you guys have just been hitting us up en masse. So I kind of feel bad making you wait two weeks to hear the answer to your question. So let's get into it. Let's let you guys drive the ship. A little bit of your mail call. Mail call. Time to look at questions submitted by our listeners. All right, everybody. We got a bunch of your questions 
Let's get right to them here on the old Options Bootcamp program. Remember, you guys can hit us up. You know how to find us at Options on most of the major social media platforms. You guys, when you're rating and reviewing, you can put questions on the platforms of choice. We just don't get to those in as timely of a fashion because that's much more of a longer term type platform. So you have a more timely question like a lot of you clearly do. Then hit us up via the usual platforms. The website also works. Questions at the Options Insider also works. If you're in downtown Chicago and want to send a smoke signal, that'll usually get to us as well. Carrier pigeon. We don't judge. <laughs> All right, let's kick it off here from a question from Ben C. Dan. This goes back to what we were talking about earlier. He says, Mr. P, that would be you, <laughs> said a quote, a bad plan is better than no plan. <laughs> you did say that in the chat. I do recall that. He says, that has resonated with me, and I have made several successful trades in a row by sticking to a plan. My question is on setting an exit plan when taking profits. Is it better to set a price slash profit target or to wait for a technical indicator? Love the show. Multiple exclamations from Ben. Well, that's interesting one. Thank you for your question, Ben. I always like it when uh, people quote us back, especially Mr. P. It's always it's always fun there. Mr. P, since he quotes you, I'll give you pride of place here. What do you have to say for Mr. Ben, who likes your quote, a bad plan is better than no plan? I would say yes. <laughs> is it better to set a price slash profit target or to wait for a technical indicator? Yes, sure. Um, it, you know, it doesn't matter. And like, honestly, I have done, I've done both. Um, I think it's very common for a lot of people to say, Hey, you know what, if I make, uh, you know, 60% on this long call, you know, I'm going to sell half of it and take my profits. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. And I do that, you know, a lot. But also to say, hey, look, if we, you know, if the this shorter term moving average crosses down below the longer term one, well, that nullifies the trade. And so uh, I'm going to take my profits there. Um, th- that's fine, too. You know, I, I think it doesn't matter as long as you decide in advance, you know, that's that's totally cool. Uh, going along with that same theme. Even a bad plan is better than no plan. Um, you, you can definitely do either. Yeah, I don't think there's any hard and fast rule. I think Dan's right. I think most people tend to do the former. They set some sort of price target, some sort of profit or loss target on their particular trade. So if it moves up X percent, they're going to pair off some of that, maybe take all of it. That's the most common, most rational, easiest way. Most people can wrap their heads around that a lot easier than if I see some other setup happening. Also, if, if the setup is changing, then it's probably going to maybe change your outlook on the trade. So I like to tend to stick to something that's a little bit more ironclad, a little bit more concrete, which is, hey, if it moves up this percent, I'm going to take off Y percent of the particular trade. And if it drops by X percent, I will take the whole thing off or something along those lines, adjust, roll down, whatever your your rules have in place there. So I definitely like to sit with a more of a price slash profit target. It's it's more straightforward. It's easier to wrap your head around and there's less room for fudge factor. You know, you start bringing in these other technicals while I'm waiting for actually this particular setup to happen. That could leave you open to saying, well, I really don't want to take it off yet. So I'm going to wait for this. And you don't want to build a lot of fudge factor into these rules because you will take advantage of it. Trust me. You'll say, I want to keep this on longer than I want. Initially, my rules say I should. And uh, don't let that happen to you. Uh, speaking of don't let things happen to you, Dan, Mr. Unlimited in the chat chiming in saying the radio stations used to hang up on those callers that wouldn't turn down their radio on their end. So, Dan, he says, I should have hung up on you early on, sir, which I guess technically I did. So I guess I did do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's true. That's true. Thanks for calling me back, Mark. Yes. You know, I'm, I'm nice that way. I did call you back. All right. Next up, we got Todd Sylvan. We actually have a couple of questions on the same line. So we'll we'll do them both together. Todd Sylvan is first. He says, like the show with the Gatsby dude, <laughs> the Gatsby dude. It got me wondering about this whole fractional options thing. Do you think that will have legs? And a similar question from BLC coming in here. Is it mini options time again? What they're referring to, listeners, I did a show. Again, if you're just listening to Options Bootcamp, you're missing out on a whole bunch of other stuff on the network, including our Options Insider Radio interview program that we do every Tuesday aka interview tuesday there we had the folks from gatsby on a couple of weeks ago they're a startup kind of options platform aimed very much at the audience of this program the very beginner options trader and initially i i wasn't enthused by their platform it was very much kind of trying to strip out the vernacular of options which i've seen done in the past and not done very well but one approach i think they're taking which is kind of interesting over there is that because i've kind of lamented about the level one level two level three 
options approval for some time. You kind of just go fill out a couple of the questions on a form and you get level three. Uh, the Gatsby folks are actually making you kind of trade a little bit so they can see what you know before they give you those approvals. That's kind of an interesting approach. So I do like that. But what he's mentioning, again, check out our Options Insider Radio interview program if you want listeners to hear it or, or to subscribe to the whole feed. You'll get it there, too. Uh, he mentioned at the end of the conversation that they're working on perhaps trying to create some sort of fractional options play for folks out there. And this is an interesting one. I kind of mentioned before on the show that it seems like with some of these underlyings getting extremely lofty, you know, Tesla was threatening $800, $900 not too long ago. I don't know where it is today. Could be $300, could be $600. Who knows what the hell it is any given day anymore. But it got pretty lofty there. Apple still pretty pricey, even though it has reverse split or has split. And then, uh, of course, we have uh, Amazon, other names that are very pricey. In general, many of the names you guys trade are pretty pricey. So it does seem like maybe that conversation is due again for the repeat, another tilt at the mini options windmill. The industry did this a few years back when Apple was threatening $700 and it was getting too expensive for people to trade. So they tried to create a mini option. Uh, I've kind of detailed the the fall of mini options on the past here on, on the network. You can check that out. But in synopsis, everyone screwed it up. The brokers tried to charge full commissions for it. The exchanges tried to charge full exchange fees. The market makers wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. So the markets were wide. So it was a disaster uh, on just about every level. And it just went away. Customers are not idiots. They weren't going to pay full commissions at the time. There were still commissions uh, for a one-tenth size contract that was super wide. So nobody touched it and they died. But maybe as Todd and BLC bring up and as our guest brought up on that show, maybe it's time to revisit that. Mr. Dan, what are your thoughts on that? Are we perhaps on the cusp of a second mini options slash fractional options revolution? Well, the thing is, is if there's the fractional options thing that's made available by brokerage firms, I don't think exchanges would need to list many options, you know? I mean, I think it's just sort of an example of uh, the private sector solving problems, um, you, you know, um, kind of in such a way where, you know, when we were down on the trading floor, when everything was, uh, if somebody wanted to buy calls, they'd have to call up their broker on their rotary phone, you know, there were, how many order types were there back in those days? Five, six, maybe? You could and buy now, and you could sell. That's about it. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, and, and now there's hundreds and it's because like brokers realize, well, geez, I can just program our platform to do all these crazy different things. And and that's the problem that fractional options solve. So I, I don't think exchanges even need to list many options. So you're on the fractional options train. I was kind of wondering when he mentioned that. And I just had the OCC CEO on a few weeks ago. I, I wish I had asked him that question now, but how the fractionals would work, right? Because that's an interesting question. You know, they have to put together the demand, obviously, on the brokerage ad to create one product. You know, is OCC going to be on board with multiple people having the same effective one options contract? You know, there's a lot of behind the scenes things that need to be figured out there. But an interesting idea. Stock is a little bit easier to do, I think, than, oh, you have one third of this call in Tesla. You have, you know, three fifths of this call. All these weird portions are going to get thrown around. How much do you guys get a proportion of that delta? What's your Vega? All these things that are just strange. <laughs> so, but interesting. It's an interesting question. I think just the fact that we're getting these questions and people are talking about it more, it seems like something is coming up. In fact, I think some of our listener questions later may, may touch on something similar along these lines. So we'll keep on rolling. Another question from Dan. He puts in parentheses, the other Dan. So not you, Dan. That's good to clarify that. He says, hey, guys, long time, first time. Well, welcome, Dan, and everyone else who falls in that category. I know there are a lot of people out there who just like to lurk, don't want to write in for whatever reason. We love you folks out there, too, but we welcome all of our first time, long time, first times, I should say. He says, I love the breakdown on put misperceptions on the last show. Got me wondering if that listener was confusing standard equity options with cash settled index options. Maybe it'd be worth breaking that down on the show. Just my two cents. Keep it up, baby. <laughs> Exclamation. Well, thank you, Dan. We also have a similar question here from Mimiki. So I'll, I'll put this one together with it. He or she writes, what if a put option is settled in cash? Do they work the same as what you described on your program? Dan, remember on our last show, we talked about the misperceptions one of our listeners had about how he put worked. He had, I think it was GameStop put, and it was threatening to go like a penny in the money. And he was, he let it go into expiration. And he was surprised when he came in that Monday morning and had a short position in GameStop. He thought he just got the, the cash differential. So clearly, I think that listener was confusing that with a cash settled put. So maybe let's, let's start there. Let's break it down. 
uh, Mr. P for our listeners. What the heck is cash settled? How does that differ from your regular options, sir? Yeah, most options are, they settle into the underlying. So if I buy like, you know, a GameStop call uh, and I exercise it, I get 100 shares of GameStop. But there's a few different options out there that it works a little differently, um, where if you hold the option until expiration, you get the in the money value of that option. And typically the only underlines that act like that are ones where the underlying is something intangible like like SPX the underlying is literally just on a number you know you can't get you can't get shares of SPX SPX doesn't really exist it just tracks the S&P 500 so they have to be cash settled so you know it's it's a little bit different it's a little bit of nuance for most people who are not holding until expiration it's almost kind of irrelevant. Uh, your profit or loss is going to be the same with cash settled or underlying settled. Um, but you know, if you hold stuff till expiration, you you really ought to be aware of those nuances. They can be important. Yeah, Dan brought up kind of the classic example of cash settled versus physically settled, which is the normal settlement you folks are used to, which is you get shares of the underlying change hands. SPX is an abstract index, doesn't really exist as a tradable entity. So you have to have effectively cash sell. You have to make up the differences between the strikes at expiration versus the SPY, which is a physically traded entity. And when your options expire, they are settled into shares of the underlying. Let's break it down for a Let's go through an example. Let's go back to everyone's favorite XYZ. We'll look at the cash settled and then the regularly physically settled uh, difference. Let's say XYZ is trading around 100 bucks as it normally is. I think our, our listener bought a put, so we're going to buy a put in our example as well. You go out, you think it's going to drop a little bit, so you buy a one month put on the 95 strike and you pay $1. Now, in our example, expiration comes one month later. The stock XYZ closes at $90. If it's a traditional, if it's just a stock, if it's your physically settled stock, what happens is you bought your 95 strike put. So that's where you have paid for the privilege to sell it at 95 anytime during the life of that option. Now you're in the money at expiration. So that option is going to be automatically exercised. Guess what? As our friend discovered, you're going to have a nice short position at the 95 strike coming in that following Monday morning after all the settlement happens. Now, of course, you can go out into the marketplace buy the stock at 90, hopefully on Monday, hopefully stock hasn't rallied since then. That's one of the risks of of letting it go to expiration. But essentially you have the stock that you sold now at 95. You can go back in the marketplace, presumably still on Monday and buy it around $90. So what you've effectively done has you've made that $5 differential. Of course, you did a one lot option is for 100 shares. So multiply that times 100. You grossed $500. You paid $1, aka $100 for the privilege of doing that. So you net made $400 $400 at the end of the day. Now, cash settled index, how is that different? XYZ, instead of being now physically settled stock, it is a cash settled index. It drops from the same thing. You buy the same put. Everything else is the same. Stop drops to 90 at expiration. What happens now? Well, instead of having this short position coming in on Monday, what our listener kind of described behind the scenes actually is going to take place. They're going to effectively give you the difference because Your options expire in the money. They're going to give you the difference between your strike price and where the underlying is at expiration. In this case, that is $5. So they're doing, as Dan mentioned, they're kind of doing effectively what you probably would do anyway, which is they're just giving you the difference. They're they're saving you the hassle and the risk of having the short position coming in on Monday and having to buy it back yourself. Maybe you want to get short. Maybe you want to keep the short position. That could be fine. But in this case, they're just giving you that difference. You're getting that $5 difference between the strikes, the 95 strike and the 90 strike. So that's five times 100. That's $500 again in your account. You paid 100 bucks for it. So you're not making 400 bucks. Same deal at the end of the day, but different thing. And obviously a different risk factor, as our listener discovered with the physically settled. You're coming in with that short position. Maybe you didn't plan in the physically settled versus the cash settled. You don't have to worry about. That's why people like cash settled. It doesn't have that latent risk factor to it. So, you know, also it's nice because a lot of those are probably European exercise as well, uh, which means they can't be exercised anytime during the life of that option, only at expiration. So it takes away some of the early exercise and assignment risk you may have of trading your typical American style options. Uh, let's see. We got a comment here from Gorby. I like that name, Gorby. Gorby says, Cheers, gents. Well, Gorby 
probably even across the pond. Cheers back to you, Gorby. This is I'm with Greg from the mail call segment. I think he's agreeing with a previous listener. He says, definitely check out the app if you are having a hard time accessing the early episodes of Boot Camp on Apple Podcasts. Mark's content is the best, and the app is chock full of it. You can listen for days. Well, thank you very much, Gorby, and everyone else who said nice things about our app. Yeah, it is kind of the best way, that and our website, the two best ways to really get access to everything that we've done over the past 14 years. And this show runs for a bit. So some platforms are going to limit how many episodes you can get access to. So get the app. And Gorby's right. If anything, he understates it. You can listen for months, probably. There's 14 years of content in there, listeners, for you guys to mainline. So yeah, you could go for a while listening to our stuff. If nothing else, we will keep you busy and engaged with options content. We make that pledge to you all right dan i mentioned some of the timely questions we're getting inundated with here's one of them here from mike dunlop mike says i have a question for you about a recent situation i had with a stock i have owned rocket mortgage since august and have done very well selling covered calls against it every month i sold a covered call against my shares rocket has been pretty steady between the 19 and a half to 23 dollars for the last while so i sold the 24 call expiring march 19th Obviously, I missed the Reddit pump and dump, but it is what it is. Uh, Rocket announced a special dividend with a date of March 8th. Uh Uh-oh, I think I know where this question is going. It says, because my stock was in the money at the time at 2470, I went on half expecting my stock to get called away early so the buyer of my call would get the stock for a 70-cent discount and get the $1.11 special dividend. I was pleased to see that my stock was still there. Uh, As the holder of the stock, I am entitled to all dividends paid, right? Question mark. Apparently not. I'm entitled to the dividend, but I was very annoyed to see that the strike price on my call was now reduced by the amount of the dividend. Essentially, the company is giving the buyer of my call the dividend and basically assuring that my stock gets called away as the $24 strike is now 70 cents. 70 cents in the money at the time is now $22.89, $1.81 in the money. Of course, with a volatile stock, things can change. So what I am seeing is I'm still getting $24 per share, but the guy that bought my call is getting my shares a dollar eleven cheaper, so he is getting my dividend. My question slash rant is: My understanding is when I sell a call, I am selling someone the right to buy my shares at a set price on a set day. That is my contract. I did not agree to sell my shares at twenty two eighty nine if the stock is twenty three eighty. My understanding is I am entitled to all dividends that are paid while I am the owner of the stock. Seems someone changed the rules. I think I know why they want to do it. They want the current owner of the stock on the dividend day to get the dividend. If it doesn't get called away, I get it. If it gets called away, I don't. But it seems like a rule change, and I can't understand how they can change the rules on my options contract, in all caps. Please answer on the Options Bootcamp podcast. I have found it and have been listening to it each week for a while now. Well, thank you for that, Mike. And let me first off say I feel you. This situation sucks. Uh, I did look it up for you, by the way. And again, I encourage you, listeners, I said it before, just literally type in your browser OCC and then your ticker symbol. I did that exactly when this question came in. I typed OCC and Rocket in this case. And the first thing that comes up, listeners, is the circular explaining exactly what's going on. This was dated March 1st with an effective date, I believe, of March 8th. Uh, They said Rocket has announced a special cash dividend of $1.11 per Class A common share. And they tell you exactly what changes are going on. They say the effective date is March 8th. The multiplier is going to be the same. Uh, So no change to the multiplier. So everything else is the same. But they do say the strike prices will be reduced by $1.11, which a listener points out. That is the amount of the dividend. So they say, for example, a strike price of $20 and I'll be reduced to $18.89. Everything else stays the same. So yeah, I, I feel for you there, Mike. You know, some of these hot volatile names, these corporate actions can come in and change the strikes. It's terrible. I, I hate it. I agree with you. But these, that's the one thing, these cash dividends and these special dividends and these other kind of surprise corporate actions can at time wreak havoc with your contract specs. Dan, I know you've been through this a few times. What do you have to say here for Mike, who feels like he got the rug pulled out from under him, sir, mid-contract? Yeah, I mean, I'm just looking. This kind of stuff happens time to time. Man, I could tell you stories, but you end up being whole. You end up being equitable. Um, I just kind of have to read it over here. Uh, You know, I mean, basically... Let's see, how would this work? <clears throat> I guess if your strike gets lowered, 
if your strike gets lowered by the amount of the dividend and your stock gets lowered by the amount of your dividend, I don't know. I'd have to think it through. But like, like, look, whenever. OK, so here's one thing. Whenever you have questions, call the Options Industry Council, 888 Options. They are the folks who do this. And they are definitely not doing it because they want the, you know, owner of the stock to get that. They don't know who the owner of the stock is. It's not like their uncle or something, you know, like it's just whoever it is. They they do it when you get these really big dividends, um, you know, well, they do it because they do it. Um, but if you ever have questions, they are the people to call 888 Options. Yeah, one of the few things that is going to change your strike, and I have seen that done before, unfortunately, here, what was it, Mike, are these kind of surprise dividends that will come in. They have wreaked, I've had people come in, what's going on, my, my, my puts are now, I thought these should be in the money, and it changes, I go back to the Options Express special dividend of a, a few years back or so, that, that would just wreak havoc with everybody. So these surprise dividends are one of the few things you kind of have to watch out for. When you're trading some of these high flyer stocks, and I know when you started trading Rocket, it wasn't as high flyy as it is now. We start trading some of these high flyer stocks. Sometimes you can expect these these weird little things to come out and pull the rug out uh, from under you. So it does look like they, the stock took its hit back on the 8th, sold off to about 24 and change, 24.07. And then it spiked back up immediately afterwards on, on you know, by the 10th, or even on the 9th, it was trading 26.93 again. So it got back that dividend and then so almost like your option expires on the 19th, but you're right. Your strike is lower now. So you're probably going to get your stock called away. So yeah, that sucks. I'm with you. You have a couple of choices now. You could roll it out, buy it back, which again, sucks. It's going to be in the money. Take your hit, let your stock go away and then reset it again. But if you're worried about another, you've got nine days until that expiration. If you're worried about more upside happening, then maybe you do close that, that option out and then roll it up to another strike. The good thing is it probably won't happen again in the near term because they kind of just did their dividend. But yeah, unfortunately, these are the kind of things that happen in some of these crazy high fly names. And I I wouldn't see it as some sort of conspiracy against you, the option holder. Uh, This is kind of when they have these dividends, they often will not regularly schedule dividends. Those are kind of priced into the options. It's these surprise dividends that kind of come in that kind of usually change up the game. But I, I think Dan's suggestion is a good one. You can contact the folks at OCC. They do have a helpline. You can ask them because they're the ones who make this determination. It's not the company. It's not the company of Rocket trying to screw you. It is OCC. You can ask them, hey, why did you adjust my strike because of this special cash dividend? And they will explain to you their reasoning and, and that will at least maybe hopefully help you prepare for it more in the future. Maybe it'll make you a little less angry. I don't know. But I'm with you. When these things change midstream, it's not quite as bad as the SVXY, UBXY, where they just kind of change the entire underlying functioning of the contract overnight but this changing your strike i agree i'm with you you have our our sympathies here mike that does suck now let us know how what you ended up doing if you end up rolling it or if you let it just go and set it and forget it maybe put on a new position you could buy more stock if you wanted and do another covered call farther out of the money uh, you could sell a put down below to get some more stock eventually There's a lot of things you could do against that maybe just leaving that covered call until it goes away but yeah, that sucks. I'm sorry for that. All right, next up, Joey. Joey Cochran, another timely one. Listeners are, we're just, we're getting too popular, Dan. The listeners are just inundating us. Uh, hello, OGC. I'm not sure what OGC. Maybe he means OBC, the options boot camp. That's what the cool kids are calling it these days. Oh, well, hello, OBC. Let's just, let's just fix that for him. I've been listening to you and following you guys for the last several months and find your knowledge and how you package that info to be extremely useful. So please keep up the great work. More exclamation points. Well, thank you very much, Joey, for tuning in and these nice words. He says, I'm interested in blockchain technology, specifically Riot and Mara. Obviously, ticker symbol R-I-O-T and Mara, M-A-R-A. And how they will grow alongside Bitcoin. What would be your general option strategy play with either company? Uh, Finally, I currently hold 22 shares. He doesn't say of which, um, maybe both. And have pulled out all of my initial investment when the spike occurred early February. But would like to know how you think I could play this. Again, thanks for doing the show. Also, (laughs) I was not, in all caps, not expecting Dan to look the way he sounds. I imagined a 60-year-old hippie dude that trades cannabis stocks all day. (laughs) Ha ha. 
So there you go, Dan. <laughs> what do you say to that? And then uh, what do you say about Riot? I'm sure your listeners are in your, I should say, your users in your community are hitting you up about Riot and Mara these days too, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, hey, Joe, how's it going, my man? Uh, he's uh, one of the folks in our chat room, unless it's just a coincidental same name. Um, yeah, so... Uh, um, welcome. Hey, it's great talking to you. I am not uh, an old hippie dude. Um, I do sometimes trade cannabis stocks. We won't talk about other things we do with cannabis. <laughs> but uh, um, let's see here. So you currently hold, so you hold 22 shares of one of those. What, you sold the rest of it earlier or you sold those 22 shares earlier? That's I think he I sold to. most of it. And he has 22 shares left. That's what I got out of it. Oh, and he had 22 shares left. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, what's so here's like the the tricky thing is that options, uh, notwithstanding what we're talking about, fractional options, which are, I, uh, you know, maybe not available to you. You, you kind of like if you want to do any hedging or, or anything like with those shares with options, you need round lots of 100 shares. So it makes it a little bit trickier in that regard. Um, so, hey, man, I would just look at it uh, and pick your spots to scoop up more or dump what you have um, and, and just manage it as a pure linear trade, uh, you know, just directional shares. And sounds like keep doing what you're doing. Sounds like you're doing great so far. Dan's right, and that kind of brings back to that discussion we had earlier about fractional or mini options, because you're the ideal use case for those. You have 22 shares of one of these hot underlines. You can't really do anything with that from an options perspective, at least as it stands right now. So I would maybe look aside from the 22 shares for a second, look at the options as kind of a new uh, position. When all these hot names, and since you sent this question in, I think it came in a few days ago, uh, Joey, these both of these names have popped pretty hard. So you know, Bitcoin has moved and everything associated with them, these mining and everything else type of names have all popped pretty heavily over the past few days. So whenever these names that are popping heavy, whether it's these names, whether it's some of the meme names, like your games or your AMCs, whenever these things are moving to the upside pretty aggressively, first off, you're going to see the vol explode. And that's I pulled up the chains for uh, for. Which one is this is Marathon right before the show here, just so I can see what was what was afoot out there. And obviously the vol is super juicy right now. It's about 228%. So that's the first thing to uh, keep in mind. This vol is astronomical. But again, it's hard to merit that it isn't earned, it isn't warranted because the stock is moving like crazy. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. When these names are popping, though, the thing that if I am going to play them, which again, usually I won't because they're insane. Uh, but if you are, the thing that usually becomes more attractive are these verticals these upside call verticals because what folks tend to do is they start piling into these names in mass and just regardless of whatever the vol levels are they start bidding up particularly the out of the money call wing to astronomical levels we saw that in the early phase of the uh, the meme stock certainly with game early on but other names like amc even slb very briefly had it there where people were just bidding up the call wing so what does that allow you to do if you like if you still are bullish on this name and it sounds like you are there, Joey, then maybe something like a vertical should be something you should look at. Again, you're going to be paying a freaking hell of a lot for something around an at the money call. In this case, a 228% vol. But thankfully, they're going to bid up those out of the money calls against it. You definitely want to have some sort of short leg against it. You have to sell some of this crazy ball. You can't just buy it. That's a road uh, to ruin. So I did look before the show really quickly. Uh, Mara was trading close to 40 bucks, about 39 bucks uh, when I pulled it up. So going out one month, the 40, 50 vertical. So pretty much an at the money call in April versus a $10 out of the money call. That vertical was trading because they had bid up those 50 calls so much for around 225, maybe 250. Again, most of that because of the hefty juice you're getting uh, the on the outer leg. You can actually get it for a somewhat decent level. I'll leave it up to you whether you think that's a reasonable price for a $10 vertical out for one month, but it is a 228 vol. If that's still a lot for you and you also are still bullish on it, you could finance a good chunk of that because there is, again, a lot of vol in this name. So like, let's say, for example, the April 25 put, that was trading for about 350 when I pulled it up. So you could actually do that vertical for 250 on the offer sell that put and still make a buck. Uh, so there, you could finance these types of verticals with things. If you're going to do that, I would maybe encourage that way. Again, that's only if you're comfortable buying Mara 
at 25. If you want to go down to the 20 put, that was trading for about a buck 50. You could do that one, have a lower strike, a little bit less risk, and you pay about a dollar for that vertical at the end of the day. Now, Mara was trading about sub five bucks not too long ago, back in December. But in this newish regime of Bitcoin being north of 40,000, which has been most of the year of 2021, Mara really hasn't dripped below or dipped below 20 pretty much for most of this year. So the 20 strike seems in the near term, at least to have a little bit of support to us. That's one way you could go. Take advantage of a nice vertical. Again, don't forget about the 22 shares. <laughs> That's You can't do anything with an op. You can't sell a covered call against that, for example. If you want to just buy more stock, you could, of course, come in and sell some puts to some of these strikes I mentioned and just forget the vertical altogether. That's another way you could go as well. So these are some things you could do. But in general, when these names are popping hot and heavy, whatever it is, Rocket, Game, AMC, Mara, the verticals usually become of the most attractive thing to do. Again, but you want to have some sort of short leg to help you take advantage of the insane levels of vol. All right, next up, we've got Jeff Davis. His name sounds familiar. I think he's the one who had the question about the puts and the, and the exercise. He says, hi, Mark Longo. <laughs> well, hello, Jeff. Now, thanks. Oh, yeah, it is him. Yes, thanks for relating my tale about the GameStop put exercise gone wrong. Hopefully, that will help some other people out there to avoid the same fate. I hope it does, Jeff. Hopefully your, your tale will resonate with others out there. We talked about it again today. And he says, in this case, I am writing about something I'm working on that you might find interesting. I'm a longtime listener of your show and a Silicon Valley engineer. So I was inspired by your show to start working on some visualization software for options education. He says, I included a screenshot to pique your interest. I very much appreciate your thoughts and feedback if nothing else, I thought you would enjoy it. I look forward to hearing from you. And Dan, I included this for you, for you to see in the notes here. Listeners, I'll try to describe it. But Jeff, this is really cool stuff, what you've sent in there. I love this. Let me try to paint a picture in your mind, listeners. But if you can imagine, let's say your traditional options chain, but now that displayed on what looks like effectively a screenshot from a, let's say, a Star Wars TIE fighter, X-wing type space fighter video game. It looks like you're in the cockpit of a star fighter and then your, your options chains are kind of displayed as kind of a, a cross kind of X in front of you. It's really cool stuff. You even have the, uh, the D pad there, the, the controller mapped to the bottom there, which is kind of hilarious. So yeah, Jeff, this is, this is really cool stuff. I'm glad to see that our show has inspired. See, Dan, we have such, such talented listeners. Would you concur, sir? I know. Yeah. Um, you know, we, didn't we have that one guy who crocheted an option chain? Uh, just recently? <laughs> yes. Yes. Old school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, this is pretty cool, man. I really like it. Um, you know, you, you got uh, some of these um, brokerage firms, you know, Gatsby and Robinhood that they talk about uh, how they're gamifying uh, option trading. Well, holy moly, you're taking gamifying it to the next level, my man. Yeah, this has a third dimension to us. I could actually see this, Jeff, maybe even like a VR. Put this in an Oculus Quest 2, and now you could reach into your chains and touch. I want to I want to trade these puts. I want to see what the vol is and touch it. That would be really cool. So I like this. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to hear more about what you're working on there, Jeff. This is really cool stuff. I love our audience. You guys are constantly surprising me in new and unique and interesting ways. Let's wrap it up here with a regular listener here. J3 Dingle. <laughs> He's got a kind of a fun question uh, to wrap up the show. He asked in to say, have you ever run a poll question on which show has the best musical intro? I vote for Options Playbook Radio. Well, I'll have to convey your sentiments over to Mr. Overby on OPR, which, by the way, already hit the network earlier today, listeners. So you already got your first dose of Education Wednesday before boot camp even. So there you go. Double dose coming at you. Yeah, OPR music is is good. I like OPR. I like, it's kind of like picking your child, right? I, I love all the music on all of our shows. Boot camp's had a couple of themes, actually. One of the few shows that has changed themes a little bit. We have the older, kind of more, you know, militaristic, the newer one that's kind of more... I don't know if you want to call it intense or whatever it is. But I kind of like that one, too. Of course, I'm partial to two. Of course, our kind of option block theme, which has become kind of the de facto theme for the network. You hear it with the network intro and outro. The old school options insider radio is one that's probably, I don't really like it as much, but it's it's <laughs> it has a bit of resonance because that was what really what created the network back on all those many years ago. That was the first theme that we kind of put together for the network and it kind of kicked off everything that came after it. So we still use it on options insider radio, even though maybe it might be time to update it 
a little dated now, but just for nostalgia's sake, that one. Mr. P, I'm going to guess you're going to go for the theme of the show you're on, but how, you're a music guy. Maybe you have some other themes that you like. Oh, yeah, I'm a sucker for the, uh, you know, the the military, dark, serious, dun, 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 that kind of stuff. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to vote for, uh, for OGB. Wait, OGC. <laughs> Would you perhaps mean that song that we're hearing right now, sir? That song, is that the one you like? Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> there you go. All right. Dan's vote is in for the show that he is on. Go figure. So, yeah, a couple of votes here. For what is your favorite list? Maybe we'll do a poll. Of course, list Twitter polls won't let you have four choices. But if you have a show, I should say, and a theme that is your favorite, hit us up here. Thanks for everyone who hit us up. We, we couldn't even squeeze all of them in on the show. I want to make sure we, we get to as many of you as we can, as quickly as you can, because your questions are coming in so fast and furious. And they're so timely, many of them, that I don't want to make you wait for just the regular episode of Boot Camp and then get your question the week after. So we try to get them in a more timely fashion. If for some reason we can't get them on Boot Camp, uh, then we'll make sure we'll answer them on some of our other shows. Another reason that you should subscribe to the full network listeners. You never know where your show's gonna, your question is going to pop up if we can't get to it on boot camp but keep them coming in we love to hear from you all the things you guys are up to your your unfortunate changes of strikes you're playing in the meme stocks you're creating your own options visualization software whatever you're up to we love to hear from you folks out there and dan what are you up to you want to share with our listeners sir? Oh, man, we're up to lots of things over here. Um, we are looking at uh, finalizing our plan- our retreat plans this year. Lips are buttoned here for just a little bit. Working on a very... I'm- I got a lot of stuff in the hopper, man. I got a lot of stuff in the hopper. Uh, really super exciting things coming over the next uh, about two months over here. We don't retreat at the Options Insider. We go forward until the battle is won, sir. There is no retreat here. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. All right. Check them out over there. Markettaker.com. Two T's. Don't forget the second T there. For Theta to learn more about what Dan's cooking up. Maybe you want to retreat with him. <laughs> Whatever floats your boat out there. Markettaker.com is the place to go. On behalf of Dan and, indeed, myself, I want to thank everyone out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for listening live. Remember, check out our friends over there at Demand Derivatives. They do, indeed, support the show and the network. And they have the cool crowdfunding. Everyone's looking at hot new startups and fintech things to invest. The Gatsby folks just raised a ton of money over there on platforms like Seed Invest. And the folks at, at over there at Demand Derivatives are doing the same thing over there at Net Capital. You can go to their website, demandderivatives.com. Their crowdfunding is still running. Not much, not much time left, but it is running. You can check it out. It is mostly funded, I do believe. But you can check it out for yourselves, demandderivatives.com. It's $105, a minimum investment. It's nothing. And you can get uh, some access to some pretty cool upcoming new stuff and some reductions on trading fees and everything else. So check it out. Demandderivatives.com is the place to go. On behalf of those guys and Mr. P and indeed myself, I want to thank everyone out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for literally inundating us with questions. Keep it coming. We love you all. That's the reason we do this show. So don't feel bad about sending us your treatises. If they're too long, I'll just send them to Dan and make him read them at night. Because <laughs> we know his attention span is very long. And we'll see you back here tomorrow for Twifo and episode two of the old Option Block Friday Volatility Views. Kick it all off again on Monday with the Option Block and the Crypto Rundown. Tuesday, Interview Tuesday, and then back again for another Education Wednesday. Another episode of Options Bootcamp. This episode is sponsored by Demand Derivatives, a startup futures exchange and clearinghouse trading the world's major assets in a creative new way. You already trade on an exchange. Here is your chance to own one. Before they approach large strategic partners for funding, the pioneering team at Demand Derivatives launched a crowdfunding portal so that regular traders have the chance to buy shares. Learn more and become a part of this revolutionary fintech project now at demandderivatives.com slash crowdfunding. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. 
select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the optionsinsider.com. <laughs> 